Before we get started, um, for you and for me, and to really just welcome the Spirit to this place, I think we ought to pray. So, if you'd bow with me. God, we come before you tonight. We thank you so much for your holiness. We thank you for how you show us, dear Lord, your plan for us, for mankind, for a way to draw us closer to you, to allow us to dwell with you. And I thank you so much for that. I thank you that you loved us that much, that you thought of a way to justify us, to cleanse us, to make us right so that we can enjoy your presence. I pray, dear Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be in this place tonight, that we would be filled, that I would be indwelt with the Holy Spirit, and that we would learn something that's not just a fact, Father, but it's something that will make a difference in our lives and the way that we see and treat others, and more importantly, the way that we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, guys. So tonight we're looking at the labor. And as I was thinking about this, I went back to kind of what's the purpose of why we're here, of why we're doing the tabernacle. Well, the story of the Exodus is essentially a story of people moving from darkness to light. It's the story of the Israelites, but it's our story as well. You see, we're still waiting for our promised land. We're waiting for the time and the place where we live in a world that is unbroken and free of sin where we become the holy people that we were always designed to be. And just like those wanderers in the wilderness, along the journey, we encounter sin and suffering and failing. But it's here, in this place, and in this difficult time, that God chooses to dwell with us, or as the Hebrew word says, to tabernacle with us. So what does this all have to do with the bronze basin? What does something that is essentially a sink have to do with this journey that we're making from darkness to light. To understand this, you have to keep in mind the experience of the tabernacle is cumulative. One thing builds on and leads to the next. So at every stage, you have to look backwards to see where you've been and what lessons you learned in order to anticipate the lesson that you're now being taught. So last week, we discovered the bronze altar and that it was all about sacrifice. It was the place where every man would go and lay their hands on an innocent animal and keep their hands on it as it was being slaughtered. And as the blood flowed from that animal, it became a substitute for that person's sin. The payment for their guilt. The big Christian-y religious word is propitiation, and it's actually an accounting word. It's as if something was taken from one person's ledger and moved to another. So it's It actually means to put to one's account. You see, what happens is that mankind's guilt and mankind's sin is transferred from his account to another's. It's essentially put on somebody else's tab. So that's the word, really, that encompasses what justification is. And that's what the sacrifice did. It was God's way of removing the penalty of sin. But now, at the same time, declaring the ungodly to be righteous through the sacrifice... However, now we come in contact with the basin, the the bronze basin, or also the laver. It's called both. And that is where we're purified from the presence of sin. So the altar of sacrifice removes the penalty of our sin, but the, um, the basin represents the fact that we're being removed from the presence of that sin and the stain that that sin causes. So here's what I mean. Let's take a look first at two words that we find in Webster's Dictionary. The first word is to consecrate, which means to declare something sacred. Remember, it's declaring someone righteous even though they aren't on their own. And then the next word is purify. Purify is to make something pure, to clean it from defilement or imperfection, or to free something from guilt and moral blemish. Somewhere between these two definitions, we see the connection of why we have the bronze altar and the bronze basin. You see, it's not enough to just be declared righteous. Because even though we're absolved from the penalty of sin and declared justified with God, what continues to happen? Sin. We continue to sin. Even though we are declared righteous, we continue to sin. The bronze basin is the place where we're forced to deal with our human condition, where we are forced to face the residue that sin leaves in our lives and to cleanse ourselves of that. So it's like this. I've been married, most of you guys know, um, if you know me, I've been married for 29 years to a great guy named John. He is a really good guy, probably better than I deserve. 
Now, what if I were to cheat on this really good guy? What if I was to have an affair and he never knew about it? Would it make a difference in our marriage? Absolutely. Because even though he never knew, and even though on the outside it might look like we had a great marriage, there would be distance between us because I would know, right? So even though I was a wife, even though everything looked good to everybody else, eventually I would pull away. The guilt and the shame of knowing what I had done would make it hard to accept his love and his affection. And I might even tell myself that what I had done was a result of something he had done. Maybe I'd try to start justifying myself and justifying my actions, and I would blame him. But in the end, we would never be the same. So that's how it is with justification. That sacrifice that was made on our behalf is enough to cover the sin. It removes the penalty or the judgment of that sin. And yet, if you notice throughout the Bible, God keeps telling us to ask for forgiveness of our sins, which I always wondered about. How could we be declared righteous, justified, Christ's blood covers everything, but yet God keeps telling us to ask for forgiveness of our sins. It's because this is what tears down the walls between us and God. It's what draws us to his side without shame and what keeps us going back to him. It's how we can avoid hiding ourselves from our God. It allows us to fully experience the joy of our salvation and willingly come into the presence of our Savior who wants so desperately to dwell with us. So how do we deal with this residue that sin leaves in our lives? Why is the act of purifying ourselves once we've already been declared righteous so important? In order to find that, we're going to look to the basin. We're going to look at how it was designed and how it functioned. So the first thing I notice about the basis, basin, we find in Exodus 38, 8. It says they made the bronze basin and its bronze stand from what? You would have known from mirrors, right. From the mirrors of the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So I have to ask myself and some of the other ladies back there in our discussion, why mirrors? Such a random thing to make this basin out of. The answer is a bit obvious to me and kind of simple um, in one way. In order to totally clean yourself up, you need to know where the mess is, right? You need to be able to see it. The priests used the highly polished pieces of brass that acted as mirrors as a way of reflecting their image back to themselves. As they stared into that basin, they could see the stains that covered them, right? It's very practical. The image would cause them to see their outward appearance, but I think there's something else reflected back as well. You see, God didn't want them to just see the stains that were on the outside. He was teaching them to take stock of what was in their own lives, what sins they were accountable for, what other stains might be on their heart. So the bronze altar may have been where they were justified from their sins, but the laver, the bronze laver, is where they go to wrestle with the effects of that sin. The process of considering our sin and wrestling with how to remove its presence from our hearts and lives is how we draw close to God. The big word for that is sanctification. For Christians, it's how we become and look more like Jesus. So I have a verse here in Haggai 1, 5 through 7, that I thought was really interesting on this topic. It says, the Lord of hosts says, consider your ways. You've sown much, but you harvest little. You eat, but there's not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there's not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put into a purse with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Now I have to ask myself, how often do I consider my ways? And what standard do I use to measure how I'm doing? I think a lot of times, instead of coming face to face with the gravity of our sin, in, in comparison to a holy God who is completely righteous, we don't do that. We look at the world around us. We measure ourselves in comparison to other people. And we think to ourselves, I'm really not that bad. I'm doing okay here. We pat ourselves on the back and we go on thinking we can feel really good about ourselves. But the problem is, is that we so often compare ourselves to the pagans and the unbelievers and the half-hearted Christians and we don't look to the holiness of God or we don't look to Jesus Christ 
when we contemplate how pure we are, how good we are at considering our ways and taking an honest look at ourselves is really crucial. Another thing I notice about the mirror is that the Bible points out where they came from. It says they came from the women who served at the tent of meeting. Now, these weren't cheap items, and they weren't the items of slaves. In fact, I would assume that they came from the Egyptians. Remember when they were leaving during the Exodus? God caused the Egyptians to give them a lot of costly treasured items. Um, And my guess is is that the mirrors, as well as their jewelry and their earrings, their brooches, the fine gold pieces that they had, were things that God had caused the Egyptians to give them. So for slaves who'd never had anything nice, anything to be proud of, anything to treasure, these would have been really special items. But they were also objects of their vanity. So I think to myself, it's hard not to love our special things, isn't it? It's hard not to love the things that make us feel good about ourselves. It's hard to choose the things of God over the riches of the world and the things that we see around us and the things that the world tells us we need in order to be happy. A big house, a nice car, the right clothes, a good purse. (laughs) Um, All of these objects are things that we tell ourselves we need in order to be happy. And that's exactly what these women are faced with. They have to choose what they're going to treasure. Now, maybe it was crossing the Red Sea. Maybe it was the guilt from the golden calf. Maybe it was the memory of the cloud that settled on the mountain. Or maybe it was just the acknowledgement that they probably didn't need these nice things in a desert. Whatever the reason, they had to consider what they were going to do with their treasures. And they came to the practical realization that there were better things they could be doing with them. They took the best of what they had, the things that the world told them made them beautiful, made them desirable, made them look affluent. They took those and they gave them to the service of God. So I thought about this a bunch because as women, I'm sure you'd agree, the world tells us a lot about how to define our worth. A lot of people have a lot to say about how we get our value. Maybe it's how youthful we look, how much education we have. Do we have children? Do we not have children? Do we have a career? Do we not have a career? Whatever it is, a lot of people are speaking into us about our value. And just like these women, we are being asked to consider where our value comes from. What standard are we going to use to determine our own worth? For these women, they chose the better thing. You see, there was nothing wrong with the mirrors. It wasn't a sin to have the mirrors. But what they could do for God's service was so much better than what they could do in the service of their vanity. And so they took the objects of their vanity and they hammered them, literally hammered them, into something that the priests would use to force them to be humble. So it's so ironic that what was a symbol of vanity becomes something that leads to humility. The other aspect of the laver's design is that it contains something, right? It contains water. And many of the pieces of the furniture that are in the tabernacle, I would argue that what they contain is as important, if not more important, than actually the furniture. Some of them don't, but some of them, especially the first two in the courtyard, really are about what they contain. In this case, it's the water. Now, the water in the basin had both a practical purpose and a spiritual purpose. The practical one is easy, right? The priests are really dirty. (laughs) If you remember from last week, they're covered in entrails and blood and fat and a lot of disgusting things. And on top of that, there's smoke and fire and soot and a smell that they have to remove. So it's no stretch of the imagination that the priests are going to need to clean themselves up, right? That's the practical reason. Now, remember our definition of purity. It's to clean something from defilement or imperfection or to free something from guilt and moral blemish. You see, the act of sacrifice of dealing with sin leaves a residue. For the priest, it was an obvious one. It was blood and flesh and fat. It was a lot of gross stuff from the animals. For us, you can't always see the effects that sin leaves on our lives. But make no mistake, the residue is there, right? We carry that residue when we encounter sin. 
Now, there are two ways that we pick up the pollution of sin, the stain of sin. The first is through our own actions, and the second is the influence of others. You see, the priests had to be cleansed from their own sin, from the choices they made, from the decisions that they arrived at that were bad, from their own rebellious hearts. But they also had to cleanse themselves from the residue and the mess that was left on them when they acted on behalf of others. Now let's talk about the cleansing of the priests from their own sin first. Now there are two plans for cleansing the priests. The first one we find in Exodus 29, 4. It says, you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Now, a couple things that I want us to notice. To begin with, this is the first mention of ablution, which is a very big word for a ceremonial cleansing of water. It's the first time we read this in the Bible, but it was probably something that was very common in that day. A lot of religions use this to show purification. They would cleanse with water. Next, it is widely assumed that this initial washing of the priests was a cleansing of their entire body, head to toe. And Exodus 29.1 explains that this was something done to hallow the priest or to make them holy, to make them holy enough to minister on behalf of the people in front of God. They were being made ready for service. So why was this one-time cleansing so important? Why did God need to cleanse these priests entirely? If we look at the writings of the tabernacle, there's an a very lengthy set of instructions regarding how something could be consecrated and purified and how Aaron and his sons specifically could be made holy. That's because ancient Israelite society operated on this assumption that there are three states that a person or an object can move between. The state of uncleanness, the state of cleanness, and the state of holiness. Now, this is where you need to stay with me because I promise it's going to make sense in a minute. You see, God lived and existed in a place of holiness, but man, even on his best day, could do no better than cleanness, and at his worst, he was considered unclean. Now, this is where it relates to the tabernacle. I want you to think of the tabernacle in concentric circles. If we were to go outside of the camp, where people that weren't believers in God lived, that would be a place that was considered unclean. But as we move closer to the tabernacle, as we come inside the courtyard, that's where people would come to make their sacrifices, and that place was considered clean. People could come in there. The priests could come in there. They could, um, on behalf of the sacrifices and by washing and cleansing, they could be made clean enough to enter God's presence. After that, after they passed by the laver, they would go into the actual tabernacle proper, the holy place. And in the holy place was where God resided. Now, the holy place is considered holy, but when we go beyond the outer room of the holy place into that one room where the priest could only go one day a year, the holy of holies, that place is considered to be holy, holy. It's holy multiplied. However, and this is where it gets really cool, in Isaiah 6 and Revelation 4, we see a place that is most holy, and that's the throne room of God. Remember the angels cry holy, holy, holy to God continually over and over again? That is because the throne room of God is where holiness is multiplied, where it is holy to the utmost. So here we have these priests, and they have to figure out a way that human beings acting on behalf of other human beings, how they could find a way to transfer from the world of the profane, where on his own a person could be unclean, or at his best, be clean, how they could be transferred to a world that was holy, how they could enter into the presence of God. And to do that, they had to be fit to serve in the world of Yahweh, and that would require rituals. These rituals had to be done exactly and purposefully. It required time and precision and attention to detail. And that is why to be prepared for the service, Aaron and his sons had to be cleansed to enter. They had to be washed from head to toe and absolved from their guilt. However, when we go to Exodus 30, 18 and 19, we see an an entirely different kind of washing. This kind of washing says that they are washed from their hands. Their hands are washed and their feet are washed. So it looks kind of contradictory, but there are, in fact, two different kinds of washing. 
One is to consecrate the priest one and one time only. The other is every other time they would enter into the tabernacle on their service for God. So in Exodus 30, 18 and 19, we read this. Make a bronze basin with its bronze stand for washing. Place it between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. Aaron and his sons are to wash their hands and feet with water from it. So why the change? How come at this point the priests only have to wash their hands and feet? Well, they've already been cleansed. They've already been consecrated. So now they need to do something to ready their hearts for service. So why particularly the hands and the feet? For starters, their hands are what do the work of the tabernacle. And they entered into the holy place without shoes. They were barefoot. So in Psalms 24, 3 and 4, it says, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who can stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. Now this is good, and I get really excited when I read this. Um, The priests wash their hands as a way of representing what they did, their work and their service, all they put their hands to. But they wash their feet because their feet represented their ways, where they walked, and their walk had to be a holy walk. So beyond being clean for their hands and their ways being clean, there's something else. And I find it really interesting that tacked onto this is this statement that says they could not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. Now, why would this be added to the idea of cleansing? Glad you asked, (laughs) theoretically. (laughs) You see, the phrase does not trust in actually means does not nurse an appetite for. And if we know anything about the Israelites, they had a lot of cravings that they struggled with. Remember when they were in the wilderness, how often they would long for the food of Egypt? Remember how many times they begged to go back to the land of their captivity? Remember the golden calf that they made? So these are people that really struggled with their idols. How often they asked to go back to the place where God had removed them from, how quickly they were willing to build an idol. If hands and feet were their work and their ways, then the idols represented the things that their hearts craved and longed for. It was beyond their actions. It was their motivation for what they did. And just like these idols that they shouldn't have an appetite for, it talks about, in the Hebrew term, idol here. And it's the, the word idol actually means something really interesting because the idol here in, in Hebrew means the word for emptiness. It's derived from a word that means empty. But it's also translated vanity. So when you see that they cleanse their hands and clean their feet, they were supposed to check their hearts for any love of things that were empty, for any vanity that they had that elevated them in their own minds. So anything that made them think of themselves more highly than they should, made themselves big and made God small, they were supposed to look at that. Is it any wonder that they cleaned themselves with water that was drawn from a basin that was lined with mirrors? Because they had to check their hearts. They had to think about what are the things that would make them vain? What are the things, the empty things that they craved? The second cleansing that the priest had to concern themselves was the cleansing on behalf of others. It was their duty, right? Their sole purpose was to serve in the tabernacle on behalf of the Israelites. And just like the blood and the fat that got the priests dirty, when we engage with the brokenness of the world, it tends to leave a residue on us as well. Our ministry can be touched or impacted by the sin of those that we are ministering to. Now, that's not to say that we're supposed to remove ourselves from sinners. Jesus clearly showed that that was not what he wanted. He ate with sinners. He sat down with the sinful woman. He over and over again told us about how we're supposed to be salt and light in the world. But when sin touches us, when we're exposed to the things that we wish we didn't know, when we see the things we wish we hadn't seen, when we hear the things we wish we hadn't heard, we have to account for that. When sin touches us, we need to be keenly aware of how to cleanse our hearts and our minds so that Satan doesn't get a stronghold, so that Satan doesn't find a way to stain us with the very things that we've encountered. We have to metaphorically wash ourselves so that we can continue to be effective in the service of God. But how do we cleanse ourselves? At the basin, the laver, they cleanse themselves with water. 
So just what is that water that has the ability to transform our hearts and minds? Let's look to Ephesians 5.26 for the answer to that. In this verse, it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. Now, at first glance, it's, it's easy to think that this is a verse about marriage. But I actually think this is a verse about how Christ loved the church and how he could make the church holy. So how is the church made holy? It's made holy by cleansing from the washing with water through the word. In John 15, 3, Jesus tells us the secret to remaining in him is to remember that we are already clean because of the word that he has spoken. You see, there's a direct link between the word of God receiving the word, and living by the word that results in our cleansing. When we expose ourselves to his message and we dwell in his presence through reading the word and meditating on it, our hearts are purified in such a way that it leads to actions that make us holy and a life that is continually drawn to his presence. What's really cool is that in that Ephesians passage, when we look at washing of the water through the word, the word washing is actually the word lavar, It's the word for the bronze basin. In the same way that the water from the lavar removed the stain of the sacrifice that was left on the priest, the word of God can wash the residue that we have when we engage in or when we encounter sin. So we're back to the original thought that we began with. How is there a link between the altar of sacrifice and the basin? With each piece of furniture that we encounter in this journey, we're being made holy being drawn closer to his presence, and moving from darkness to light. Next week, we're going to enter the holy place. To go inside the holy place, the priests had to pass through the courtyard, and they had to pass by the blood and the water. Now, where do we find the perfect sacrifice and the perfect source for cleansing for our hearts? It's at Calvary. In John 19, 34, it tells us that when Jesus' side was pierced, out flowed blood and water. You see, Jesus not only provided the perfect substitute for the penalty of our sin, he loved us enough that he provided living water that could cleanse us from the residue of our sin and the presence of our sins. He removes the presence of sin in our lives and allows us to enter into a relationship with him, to dwell with him. As all of us take this journey, we're caused to pause at every step along the way. And I love that Aaron always asks this. We're caused to ask, what does this say about my God What does it reveal about me? And also, how has this challenged my way of thinking? And what is God calling me to do as a result of having learned this? You see, the Israelites had to rely on the blood for regular sacrifices to remove the penalty of their sins. We see in the tabernacle that God was a holy God, and he could only be approached by those who were holy. And I think sometimes in our world today, we've lost sight of the fact that God is really holy. It's no small thing to get to pray to him. It's no small thing to come into his presence and assume that he will hear our prayers and that he will accept our worship. So God did for the Israelites what they couldn't do for themselves at the tabernacle. He declared them righteous. However, it wasn't a lasting state. Remember, they had to continually and on a regular basis offer those sacrifices to atone for their sin. But God would later provide through Jesus Christ the perfect sacrifice, The sacrifice that would atone for sin would only have to be done once and was enough to cover everything. God would later provide that. And my question for us, since we are on the other side of that, is have you ever trusted in Jesus Christ? Sometimes I think we come into here and we assume that everybody who studies the word of God has had a specific time in their life where they've accepted that. But sometimes we haven't. Um, I think it's important to consider that to consider that Jesus Christ is the only way to rid our sinful nature and to get rid of the sins that as human beings we can't avoid. If you're not sure about how to do this, ask your table leader or ask one of us because we'd love to tell you and we'd love to share with you what that looks like. And finally, just like the Israelites had to be purified from the stain of their sin before they could enter God's holy place, we also need to remove the residue of sin from our lives, the residue that keeps us from a close relationship with the Father. Remember when Peter said to Jesus, you shall never wash my feet? What did Jesus say back to him? He said, if I don't wash you, then you have no part with me. I love that it says you have no part with me. It's so relational. 
Because when we cleanse ourselves, not because we need to remove the penalty of sin, if we're Christians, if we're believers, we've been justified. That penalty has already been removed once and for all. But our loving Savior, who knows who we are, who knows our propensity towards guilt and shame, he lovingly wants us to feel purified, to feel clean, and to feel good to come boldly before him into the place where he is, to dwell with him, or as the Hebrew word says, to tabernacle with him. So that's it. Thank you, guys.